Golden Black Live segment two, Brian Newbert and Tom Deanhart uh, join me and uh, obviously a lot to talk about uh, uh, with what's going on uh, with the uh, COVID-19, the coronavirus, et cetera. A lot to, to hit on that. Obviously, spring football is still going on today. Purdue men's basketball makes its trip to Indianapolis tomorrow to play. Uh, I guess they're actually leaving today, but we'll be playing tomorrow at Ohio, against Ohio State in the Big Ten tournament. I want to thank our sponsors also. Hilton Garden Inn, when tomorrow's a big day, stay at HDI tonight. Triple X on the hill, but on the level of Purdue tra tradition, I should say, since 1929. And of course, State Farm agent Trent Johnson at trentismyagent.com. Uh, and we appreciate all of you in our 10th year of doing our show. And I, I'll start a little bit uh, on spring football. Obviously, well, let's first start with the with the uh, coronavirus. And obviously, Purdue's announcement <coughs> yesterday. Uh, not surprising because Indiana did it, Ohio State's doing it, uh, where the university is going to be shut down, uh, or at least after spring break, uh, there won't be no classes, no face-to-face -face classes, and not really sure, none of us are sure how long this is going to go on, but yet Purdue will continue with, uh, obviously, football practice today, but it appears, at least of now, that spring football will continue for uh, after they get back as well. Yeah, that's that looks like it's the plan, Al, and this will be practice number eight past the halfway point of spring football. As you noted, the team will be off next week. They're supposed to resume practice March 23rd, but the important thing to know is, is what I've been told is this is a very fluid situation. Um, policies could be rewritten within 24 hours, right. Alan, as far as access, as far as sporting activity goes. Uh, so again, this very much a, is a story that continues to evolve, as Alan noted. We've seen nationally as some of these schools take action already. I saw the CBI tournaments canceled. Yeah, correct. Of course, the Mac's going to play their tournament and not have fans. The Ivy League's flat out canceled theirs. So it seems like every hour there's some new, uh, new big announcements. But again, for Purdue's athletic standpoint, right now, um, for all their activities, there, there are restrictions, but the important thing to know is spring football will continue. Uh, as far as an NIT game goes, I guess that's still a little bit TBA at this point. If yeah. it's a host one, I should say. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, your perspective. I mean, it's just it, it is, and it is ramp. I mean, it's clear that what we say today may be very yeah. different. Yeah. Yeah. If Purdue ends up in the NIT, um, my strong suspicion would be that the NCAA will take some sort of action that would render whatever policies Purdue has in place as redundant. Uh, I don't think you can necessarily cancel the NIT unless you've done something with the NCAA tournament right. because I don't think from an optics perspective you can say one group of spectators health and participants health is more important than the other so I think if you cancel the NIT you would almost have to have at least kept crowds away from the NCAA tournament it, obviously it's a lot easier to cancel the NIT than it is the NCAA tournament um, but I think obviously this is a day-to-day -day deal I mean yeah. assuming this isn't our extinction event which hopefully it's not yeah. um, this is something that's going to go on for a couple, presumably weeks or months here, and things are going to are, are going to kind of evolve here over the course of time. So, whatever is in place today in terms of policies or the outlook for an NIT uh, situation might be very different tomorrow. Yeah, and I, and I think that is the overriding thing. I mean, I think it's almost you know there's some reports today, New York Times, uh, uh, et cetera, that. <clears throat> Paint a picture. It's it's obviously changing dramatically, and and it is hard for me to fathom that you could play you you would not have he'd have an NCAA tournament without any fans. But also, if we're going to deal with the health crisis efficiently, effectively, to deal with ultimately what is important, you know, it may end up being that way. I guess yeah. I, I I don't have a hard time seeing that. The the big money is the TV money. Yeah. And the games will still be broadcast. Viewership probably be higher than ever. Yeah. Uh, but again, Alan, getting back to the letter Mitch Daniels sent out yesterday, you saw it. Yeah. I think there was a, 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 a graph in there that said there would be no on-campus events with more than 50 people gathered. Right. And that's, I think, to May 2nd. I mean, commencement could be jeopardized that's at right. this point. He said that these Grand things, Prix. So, so the, Purdue, the Purdue challenge is off already. So we're all those things, I mean, it seemed like they're a little grander than hosting an NIT game. And, yeah. And, and you're going to certainly have more than 50 people at an NIT game on yeah. campus. So. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see what, what, what plays out. So, all right, Brian, uh, obviously tomorrow, and you had availability yesterday, Purdue's got to f focus on uh, obviously <laughs> going up against a team that beat it soundly, soundly uh, earlier this or earlier in February at uh, Columbus and Ohio State. 
the challenges ahead for Purdue as you look at that 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 uh, matchup and and what uh, may transpire tomorrow night in Indianapolis. Yeah, well, Ohio State is very physical defensively. Yeah. Uh, they make it really hard to make your cuts. They make it really hard to get the spaces you need to get to function offensively, and that's that's not. Such matchups haven't been kind to Purdue this season. I think you know their guards. I think are, are pretty limited at this stage of their career in terms of their ability to get off physical defenders, to get out into where they need to be to make plays. And Ohio State uh, is really up there with Illinois, Penn State, some of those other teams that really gave Purdue problems in terms of their ability to sort of twist that knife. Purdue's got to be as decisive, as aggressive, and play as hard offensively in this game as it has all season uh, to be able to do what they want to do offensively. I think if Kyle Young's out for Ohio State, I think that makes a difference. Uh, but I think the single biggest difference in this game is Purdue's ability to score against an opponent who's going to make it really, really difficult for them to score. Yeah. Brian, we, we got to know the, the, the most important question of all coming from an answer from you is what does Purdue have to do in your mind to get an NCAA bid? You know, I'm not convinced that they're not, they can't work themselves back into that situation where they're one foot in, one foot out mm -hmm. if they win two or three games in Indianapolis. Um, obviously, if they win the whole thing, they're in. But if you get to the title game, even if you win only two out of the f out of the four games you would need to get the automatic bid, I'm not so sure they can't give the NCAA committee something long and hard to think about here. Purdue was all set up to kind of be the new poster boy for what exactly it means, mm -hmm. what NCAA tournament selection in the year yeah. 2020 means, uh, because there's supposed to be so much emphasis put on the net rankings. There's supposed to be so much emphasis put on putting in what you can consider to be the 65 best teams. Um, and Purdue's computer metrics and whatnot stack up against a lot of people who are going to be playing in right. the NCAA tournament, but Purdue didn't win as many games. If you can get the three games over 500 and add a couple more really quality wins from the Big Ten, the Big Ten's gravitational pull is going to be <clears throat> have some serious strength to it uh, in all likelihood because it is – regarded by almost every measure as the best conference in college basketball. But I wouldn't bet on it either. Uh, you know, produce one game over 500 at the end of the regular season, expecting that to get you in the NCAA tournament without a serious run in Indianapolis, obviously, is, is, it is, is foolish. But my point here is that all of the past precedent we would go on in such situations, I think, is out the window because they've changed the model so much to where – you don't necessarily know what's really going to matter when it matters most. And I think that, again, if Purdue can get to like three games over 500, add a couple more quality wins to that resume, Ohio State would certainly be one. Whoever you get in round two would certainly be another. To Michigan State. Correct. Right? Yeah. Um, and that, then you have to beat Maryland. That could give you something to at least get you back in the conversation. Yeah. Um, but well, I, I, obviously, first things first, Purdue's got to – yeah, yeah. got to make some And they haven't shown that they can win three games in a row. I mean, they haven't shown they can be the same team three days in yeah, a row. I, that's so that's of, your problem. Jerry Palm, we talked, and he was going to be a guest today, and I and I said, hey, you've got a bigger fish to fry because Purdue's not sitting on the bubble right now. But he did have the comment yesterday via email that, you know, if you get to Sunday, uh, you could be 19 and 16. Even if you lose on Sunday, right. that would that would put you precisely my point. Put put yeah. you possibly in the in the in the in the running there. I think I think anything short of that, and you're, you're so so you think you need three wins. Well, yeah, I think I think to even be in the conversation. Okay, wow, you know, okay. and that would still. And again, the, the problem for Purdue is we all are aware that uh, the Boilermakers uh, to play to beat three quality opponents, they haven't shown uh, consistently they can do that. They're, obviously, there's, but motivation is another interesting thing. And Brian, I think we talked about this earlier today while we're, while we're talking. This, the, uh, does that become a? Um, I mean, Purdue has. Purdue and maybe Indiana are the teams with the, with the most motivation to show something because just about everybody else is safely in the tournament. Uh, how do you – how do you do, does that play any – I mean, everybody else that's supposed to be in yeah. the tournament is safely in the well, tournament. Well, you have – you have nine to ten teams or probably nine teams who go to the Big Ten tournament with their NCAA tournament They're set. play set, set. Their seed is probably pretty well determined. Uh, theoretically, that – could matter because the teams with the most to play for, again, theoretically, should 
Play harder. Play with the most urgency. Yeah. Should play harder, wherever yeah. it may be. That being said, both Purdue and Indiana have had their opportunities yeah. to do that in this very situation. And Purdue lost three of its final four home games, which yeah. is unfathomable by Purdue's past standards. Big collusion? Yeah. I know, I know. <laughs> you know, perhaps – I'm joking, of course, but if some of these teams that are above Purdue and Indiana in the pecking order here maybe don't place the same emphasis on this event as Purdue and Indiana should, maybe you don't necessarily get the best effort, you're probably grasping at straws here in thinking this dynamic might actually apply. But the team who has the most to play for, theoretically, in any sporting event yeah. should – have a little bit of an advantage at least, and Purdue certainly has everything to play for. I think Indiana obviously has to beat Nebraska. If they can't beat Nebraska, they shouldn't obviously go to the NCAA tournament because, A, Nebraska's terrible, and, B, Nebraska's a, a shell of its former terrible self. Yeah. They just brought out football players to fill their yeah. roster. Um, that being said, beating Nebraska does you very little yeah. uh, other than your win total going up by one. I They're think that – even Indiana may have to win that second game, too. But obviously those two teams have a lot to play for here. Everybody else pretty much knows what's going to happen after this. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. And the whole environment is going to be, obviously, with all the, the coronavirus stuff, it's going to be an interest, just a, It's going to be an interesting few days, not all of it, unfortunately, good. All right, Tom, uh, we'll, we'll switch gears now to, to spring ball and the Boilermakers. Uh, again, this will be the last practice before spring break that you talked about. Uh, what kind of vibe you haven't been in, haven't been in the last few practices? Just been able to talk after. What kind of vibe are you getting from the from the front end of practice today? Well, they're being very secretive about the defense. Yeah, I think that's obvious to anybody who's watched the videos that we've posted. Yeah, saying very little by design, uh, wanting to keep Bob Diaco's schemes I guess, under wraps. So uh, I guess stay tuned. Right, we'll get our next look uh, at the spring game on April fourth of the defense and everything else in live action on the field. So. Um, again, just a lot of questions still there defensively. See how the personnel fits together. See what the scheme looks like. Three, four, four, three. Who's playing where? Yeah. And then offensively, uh, you know, uh, that, that, that's where a lot of the excitement is. I think you got the established wide receivers. Yeah. Rondell Moore's healthy. Of course, David Bell's still out. You know, uh, quarterbacks. They're still being a little cautious with Jack Plummer and his yeah. ankle. Um, and uh, we'll talk to the offensive lineman today. Grant Herman's will have to be the bellwether there. Uh, a lot of uh, a lot of holes to fill on that line. What's going to happen at center? Is Sam Garvin really the guy? Is Will Bramble the right gu- right tackle? What's going to happen at guard? Is going to be Cam Craig? So on and on it goes. Uh, but again, the skill talent on offense um, looks like it's uh, going to be very tantalizing once again. Yeah, one of a guy that we've had on our show a couple times, and Justin Lovett, obviously moving on too in an interesting time frame. Uh, that going on to, to, to the Los Angeles Rams, what uh, and you, did, you had a chance to talk to Justin. Obviously, said the right things about his experience here, but a great opportunity for him coming. Up. Couldn't say no. Yeah. He couldn't say no. Uh, he has a few connections out there, a couple players he's trained in the past. He told me he did not know Sean McVay, the Wonder Kid head coach of the Rams yeah. at all, or less, neither general manager. But again, just a tremendous opportunity for a guy. Who did a lot for Purdue in his three plus years here, Alan? Uh, had some NFL experience already, having worked for the Broncos, so this is a new terrain for him. But a, a chance for him just to continue to learn and to work at the highest level of the sport. Now, if you're Purdue, it's, I guess it's never an ideal time to lose your strength coach. This certainly isn't an ideal time. Uh, who knows? Maybe, maybe uh, I'm sure Jeff Brom is already looking. Maybe they'll have somebody in as soon as May or June. But the point is, Alan, whoever that someone is cannot come in right away and just totally change the training program from day one. I've been told it's going to have to be a gradual process because a lot goes into establishing these training techniques, these guidelines, these, these uh, again, the whole, the whole shooting match as far as the, the repertoire of the training regimen goes is developed over time. It's going to have to be implemented over time, whoever that new person is. But physicality, I mean, it is part of, if you're talking about the offensive line, and Brian, you know, it, it's been such an, that position is such an important thing as you move forward, but being able to get that uh, at the level, because Purdue had a lot of injuries last year, but they have some yeah. offensive line they got to develop. I mean, this, this is why it's important. It's got to get better. Yeah, and that's been 
that's been Purdue's struggle for as long as I can remember yeah. is being that team at the line of scrimmage that is more physical than its opponent, as physical as a lot of the Big Ten opponents. That obviously the the onus is on the offensive line and will be, you know, until the end of time, until they get this thing stabilized uh, to where you've got players coming into your program early, developing, and then leaving as seniors and handing off to juniors instead of registered yeah. freshmen and, and, and mm -hmm. graduate transfers. Um, that's, but that's been Purdue's challenge for years, and there, there are a lot of root causes to that probably that begin in the recruiting process uh, more than anything. But Purdue just has to, be, has to be better at the line of scrimmage, and from a defensive perspective, I think obviously you always have to be good against the run um, in the Big Ten. That's going to be their challenge in whatever new defense they they employ this year. That obviously speaks to the physicality of your linebackers, the physicality of your defensive backs, and on down the line. It obviously is a really, really important um, offseason for Purdue, as they're all important. Yeah. But staying healthy, too, is another big part of this as well. I don't think last year's rash of injuries can possibly be tied to a strength program in any way, shape, or form. But I'm sure they're probably looking at every little angle about everything, trying to figure out what yeah. you know what happened. Yeah, the, the uh, uh, broken shoulders and, and those kind of things are hard to hard to pin in that situation. But yes, that's that's going to be an interesting thing that uh, Purdue will have to continue to develop. All right, junior day also Purdue had a dozen or so guys in uh, over the weekend. Got shown at least a good environment. A disappointing loss, obviously, in the Rutgers game. A lot of football guys here. Any overriding theme? I know you've talked, you've written, but talked to several of those guys that were here. But uh, what's you, what's been the vibe uh, coming out of Junior Day? The same as it kind of always is. I mean, people. <laughs> Everything's good. Purdue does a good job with its visits. They always do. The coaches seem to hit it off pretty well with uh, all these recruits. The recruiting staff does an excellent job um, with all of this stuff. I think you know what's really important in this class, in every class, is that Purdue do a good job on the offensive line. They've been probably kind of waiting for that breakthrough offensive line class where they get a really higher caliber of high school recruit. It just so happens Indiana this year has a bunch of high major type of, of prospects, and uh, whether or not they're those transformative level of prospect, I don't know, but Purdue already has Jalen Allstott, Van de Banter committed from Mooresville. His high school teammate, Zach Richards, is a guy they offered really early. He was here this weekend. Things look really promising there. Joshua Sales from Brownsburg were uh, Preston Terrell is obviously already committed the wide receiver. Things look kind of promising there. It seems like uh, Purdue could get off to a pretty fast start here on the offensive line on top yeah, of other which positions. Is What's really time. weird about this is that Purdue might be in a, a good position to get Zach Richards, the offensive guard from Mooresville, might be in a good position to get Josh Sales, the offensive tackle from Brownsburg. Both of those guys already have teammates committed to Purdue. Whether or not those two things are connected or not, I don't necessarily know, but... Um, Purdue could, if those two guys fall in place, Purdue could have four commitments from two high schools yeah. uh, here pretty soon. Yeah, going to be interesting to see to watch that uh, transpire. So stay tuned. We'll have a practice report tonight uh, uh, from football, uh, then off for, a, for a basically uh, 12 days, uh, and then Purdue basketball uh, tomorrow night uh, from uh, – from Bankers Life Fieldhouse, and as long as the Boilermakers can go, and we'll obviously, obviously do the best we can too to keep you. Uh, you've read all about uh, what Purdue's, Purdue's school prospects are over the next few weeks, but this is going to be an ever-evolving story, and uh, one that we're not. Uh, none of us thought we'd ever have to deal with in terms of. I mean, this uh, this whole uh, coronavirus deal has been been really. Uh, been amazingly, uh, and, and and obviously not to take the health part of it out of this because it's such a such an important uh, thing that uh, we get dealt with uh, sooner than later. Guys, uh, be well in the next period of time, and we'll <laughs> we'll end to all of you out there as well. We'll take a short break, and then we're going to bring Tyler Oaks in. We'll talk a little bit about uh, sports gambling and uh, and, and his. Uh, uh, insight on that, obviously a big topic that you're seeing a lot of now uh, in the college realm. So take a, ch a short break. We'll see you in a couple minutes on Golden Black Live. Let State Farm Agent Johnson handle all the moving parts to your engine. Whether it's for auto, home, life, or financial services, Trent Johnson is there with more ways to help and more ways to save. Call or visit Trent today.
Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Going to the Purdue